welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. And that's right, I played the conspiracy intro, and you know what that means. Whenever I play that intro, it means we're going to talk about something that could be, possibly, maybe, a conspiracy. Uh, although usually when I talk uh, about conspiracies on this program, I'm talking about government type of conspiracies, uh, things related to the government or NASA and that sort of thing. This may be a different type of conspiracy. Um, I'll let you guys decide after we're done with this broadcast. Uh, could it be simply um, something that got lost in translation, or could it be something perhaps deeper and darker where the enemy of all of mankind, i.e. Satan, Lucifer, the devil, may have had plans to try to get us off track? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. My guest tonight is an individual named Andrew Hoy. And uh, I met Andrew uh, as a result of um, some of the things that I've been covering uh, on my YouTube channel and uh, on Facebook and things like that. And actually a mutual friend contacted me and said, hey, this guy Andrew's been trying to get a hold of you. He sent you a package in the mail. Uh, and, you know, to be fair, to be honest with you, I, I get a lot of mail. And if it's much more than a page long, it goes into the uh, I'll get to it later pile, which I almost never have time to get to. So uh, he had sent me a rather thick packet and um, didn't have time to look at it. I saw there was a thick packet, put, in the, it, put it in that pile. and But then this individual happened to catch me one day uh, on the phone, had a good conversation with this person and said, you really need to look, in, look for that mail, see if you've got it. It would be worth your time. And uh, I did. I found the package, opened it up, looked through it, and um, frankly was blown away. I was um, impressed but had a lot of questions, and we'll perhaps get to some of those questions uh, this evening. Andrew Hoy worked as a professional engineer for over 15 years, uh, searching for greater meaning. He embarked on an African missionary work where he began questioning traditional church doctrines. I know what that's like. After every, every single mission trip I went on uh, came back a little bit more jaded when I came back to the Western church uh, and began to question a lot of things uh, when I got back here, so I can certainly relate to that. He says only after he moved to Israel to study the scriptures did he find the answers. Well, go figure, right? <laughs> the answers are in the Bible. All along with a passion for discipleship and an authentic understanding of the Great Commission. Well, amen to that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring my guest on now. Andrew, are you there, sir? I am here, Rob. Hey, man, thanks for coming on tonight. Really appreciate you uh, coming on my radio show. Sure thing. I hope to enjoy it. I think I'll enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, well... Um, that's a very brief introduction, so d just for the sake of my listeners and for, you know, for, for me as well, uh, why don't you tell us all a little bit more about yourself? Um, how did you come to know the Lord? And uh, tell us a little bit about your professional background. Okay. Um, well, I'm a Milwaukee native, but I grew up in the Burbs, and I was uh, born into the Lutheran world, and um, I guess... It wasn't until school. I, I went to a Milwaukee School of Engineering. Uh, Dad was a professor, so it was a pretty, pretty logical choice where to go to school after I finished high school. And uh, basically in uh, thermodynamics class, I came to realize that uh, you know, there are no free lunches. Uh, there's the first and second law of thermodynamics, uh, which uh, we're talking about entropy and uh, or, or the degradation of, of energy and whatnot, uh, and the conservation of matter. And I, I started thinking, you know, how does this whole, the Big Bang mechanics work, and uh, concluded that uh, one of these two scientific laws uh, need to be, in a sense, violated. So there's, there's something, you know, greater uh, beyond that. So that was really my uh, you know, true point of conviction. Um, after that, I, I uh, went to work for the power and utilities a little bit. I uh, got uh, certified as a professional engineer. Um, I hit around 30, and I started doing a lot more soul searching. Uh, you know, grandmother died and starting to ponder the meaning of life a little bit more. Uh, got a little bit more into the, the church uh, setting and, and um, uh, basically started auditing an uh, Old Testament uh, graduate class. Uh, not not long thereafter, I ended up uh, losing my job. Uh, that was kind of around the time that Enron uh, threw a monkey wrench in the, in the whole uh, energy economy. Um, with the uh, job loss, I, I wanted to do something different. That's why I did the the African uh, is kind of a, a hybrid uh, religious humanitarian thing. 
Uh, well, that gave me a lot of time to read, and also, like you, you mentioned before, a lot of time in the question is I, I saw things that were going on that just didn't make any practical sense, and I was wondering how it now it tied into the Bible. So, um, started studying the Old Testament, the ministry, uh, uh, priesthood, Levitical system. You know, what does it all mean? Where did it all come from? You know, how is it now? Why is it now? And uh, after that, eventually got a job in, in engineering again. Um, in you know, 2005, uh, I made my first trip to Israel. Um, I ended up uh, reading uh, Jordan Rubin, The Maker's Diet, uh, which is a kind of interesting testimony. Um, he, uh, he he came down with Crohn's disease and ended up really sick and more or less uh, got, got healed through kosher and organic eating. And um, he said it's a fascinating testimony, but he, he left out a lot of exegesis and uh, 2007, I was driving to Minnesota, and I said, "Well, I got, I'm going to write a book about that because it was, it was one of those things that was picking at me and haunting me." And so that was the beginning of uh, uh, my 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 book uh, writing efforts, I guess. Um, so I wanted to do a, a kind of a kosher exegesis of New Testament texts. Um, well, that didn't uh, finish up right there because uh, you know I kept learning and kept learning I was wrong about a lot of things. Um, so I, I got involved with the home fellowship and uh, started getting turned on to, to more Hebrew. And uh, my friend Aaron, he said, "Yeah, we, we should learn Hebrew." And I said, "Yeah, well, why not? Let's let's do that." Well, after two weeks of saying that, he moved away, and I said, "Well, I said I would do it, so I'm going to keep at it." And uh, as time progressed, again, I just realized how, how many things I didn't know and had to unlearn, relearn, and and. Uh, um, Eventually, I ended up losing my job uh, once again, um, and this time I'm like, well, what do I do? And I had this Hebrew root session, so I said, well, I, I think I'll, I'll learn some more Hebrew. And um, I was wondering, how do I learn Hebrew good and quick? And I said, well, I uh, found up, did a little research and found the only thing that was going to satisfy my appetite was moving to Israel and going to Ulpan there. So uh, I continued working on my book, and I finished it. Uh, it was a pain, and after that I said, no more book writing. Um, then I ended up, uh, 2013, uh, Electric Universe Conference in, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And, uh, again, riding the, riding the plane home, I got inspired to write again, even after I said, no more. And I, and I really suppressed that for a while. Um, but then I started, uh, started writing anyway again. And, and, um, I mean, it's, it's almost like taking uh, sour milk out of the refrigerator and putting it back in and, and coming back to it and say, well, maybe it'll be better this time, you know. Um, so this is when I, I kind of uh, started studying a few uh, Hebrew words um, in particular and, and, and uh, was, was on the word cherubim, uh, you know, wondering how that uh, tied into uh, things electrical in the Bible. And uh, one of the occurrences was Exodus, which led me to the tabernacle study. So I had no real desire. Uh, I had no desire to. Um, no, that's my train of thought there. Uh, so you're doing uh, some. Oh uh, yeah, the cherub. I, so I, I had no desire to, to to start studying the tabernacle, but um, that's that's where this thing led me. So that's how I I started doing what I'm doing now. Okay, so uh, I want to back up and uh, on that uh, kosher thing. Um, you know, a lot of people in Christianity today would say, "Oh, well, Jesus made all all the all, all meats clean again." What would you uh, What would you say to that? Well, I, I dedicate a chapter of my book to that, and I, I start that's uh, Mark seven, and uh, that's that's what really disturbed me. I had a, a red letter Bible, and you know, reading the whole thing, and and. Uh, I see red letter, red letter, red letter in Mark 7 up until uh, towards the end. And, and uh, there's a parenthetical statement, and it said, you know, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. I'm like, well, wondering why why isn't that, you know, red letter too? And I, I started digging more and found out that that's a, uh, you know, that's it's really a uh, extra biblical, uh, extra biblical, uh, supplement, if you will, that that, that it's a stapled on doctrine that the, the church has kind of uh, put in there. So, um, so that's again the, the, just the first chapter, starting out on that, and I, I expand into the other ones uh, down the road. 
Yeah, I actually did some research on that as well and, and you know, realized that uh, uh, there's a lot more um, translator insertions in our Bible than I think most people would uh, be willing to admit to. Yeah, it really is. Uh, it's it's stunning. It's appalling. It, it makes you want to weep and, and almost uh, shred the books because... Uh, uh, I don't care which which English translation you got. You, you're you're sitting on a stack of uh, uh, mixed translations. I mean, what it says uh, in uh, Deuteronomy, it says in Revelation, it says in Proverbs. You know, don't add to, don't subtract from. And hey, guess what? That's exactly what you're doing when you're translating. So it's uh, it's of lesser quality there. I mean, Mark seven, it's talking about hand washing. It, you know, that's the the basis of the conversation. So. You know, suddenly they're adding this this one parenthetical statement saying, oh, you can eat all food now. It's like, well, does that make everything food? Does that make glass food? I mean, it, it doesn't just make everything good to eat. Just because you can shove something in your mouth doesn't mean it's a good idea. I mean, we learn that as babies, don't we? It's, uh, I think I did anyway. But. Well, I mean, even just that, that one passage, Joe, that everybody wants to base an entire doctrine on um, Mark seven nineteen. This is one of the reasons, one of many, that I'm a huge advocate for uh, having a parallel Bible or some sort of software resource where you can compare translations. Because, uh, you know, while I grew up on the King James and um, it, I was raised on it, I study from it regularly, um, but I'm always comparing it. And whenever I see another translation that, you know, most of the time it's just subtle, you know, changes in the, in the way the words are, are laid out. Um, but there are other times where another translation says something completely different uh, than what the King James says. So that has always intrigued me because it's caused me to say, well, what does the original Hebrew say or what is the Greek or Aramaic or whatever? And it causes me to go get the concordance and look stuff up. But I would say in this particular instance, the King James got this one right. It says, uh, because it entereth not into his heart but into the belly and goeth out into the drought, purging all meats. It's talking about how all meats get purged out through the digestive system. Indeed, yes. But, but when you look at, like, the NIV or some of the other ones, like NIV says, but it doesn't go into their heart but into their stomach and then out of the body, parenthetical. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. <laughs> it's like, no, he didn't say that at all. Exactly. So I, I, I went back and, and looked at that in the Greek and everything because I'm like, well, i, I got to get to the, the, the real bottom of it. And, you know, the purging all meats... Uh, you know, I do, I do a comparison uh, at the end of the book uh, just on, on that um, Mark seven nineteen thing and uh, comparing about, uh, I don't know, this from my recollection, like two-thirds are what I'd call unclean translations where they're, they're putting on, you know, something, uh, you know, doctrinal surplus. And I think they do it based on the, the perce- perception of a semicolon being present or absent. And my understanding with uh, the, the Greek, I'm not... You know, Hebrew is my, my real passion. I, I really don't study a lot of Greek, but um, they're they're basically saying that that's like a you know beginning of a, a quotation mark in, in you know one of the, uh, the the Greek manuscripts and everything. But it's in, in, in so it's it's inconsistent with the rest of the text. It's it's uh, getting in this whole thing that you know God's changing His mind, saying, well, it's good now, it's bad later. You know, if sin is sin, is and that which is harmful is harmful. It stands to reason. That that hasn't changed, you know. What's what's wrong was wrong. What's wrong remains wrong, and same thing with with what's right. Well, yeah, and uh, you know, God knows how He created our bodies. He knows how He created things like pork or pig. You know, He knows how He, cre- he knows how He created pigs. He knows how He created lobsters and shellfish and different things, uh, shrimp and whatnot. And He knows what's good for our bodies uh, and what's not. And to think that you know. Uh, Yeshua dying on the cross all of a sudden changed the anatomy of pigs um, so that they're all of a sudden good for people is just plain ludicrous. And the fact that even secular scientists who have no dog in this hunt, they don't care about the Torah, they don't care about the New Testament, they don't care about religion, will tell you that stuff's bad for you anyway. You know, the the, the Center of D- Disease Control never called all meats clean. <laughs> no, no. I mean, look at, uh, you get a paralytic uh, shellfish poisoning, you get, uh, uh, well, it's just the whole concentration of uh, heavy metals, you know, like within, uh, you know, pork fat, and let's say the, within the organs of pork, you're getting like 
I want to say seven times uh, heavy metal concentrations and all that. And, you know, um, you know, did Jesus know about that? Did Jesus declare all foods clean or, or just didn't we have as many heavy metals at the surface of the earth back then? I mean, uh, that, that whole thing, it's I mean, well, basically I, I ended up proving kosher all the way back to, to Genesis. Uh, that's you know, part of the reason why, uh, um, you know, there, there's this dispensational confusion is, is why. You know, everyone thinks so. Oh, in, in the garden, everyone's vegetarian, and then, and then came Noah. Then they could eat everything. Then came Moses, and he got cruel and and restrictive. And then, you know, Jesus sets us free, hooray! And, and Paul makes us even more free, except for well, those guys in between in Acts just don't eat the blood, and you're fine. I mean, the whole thing. I mean, I, I can see why people are so confused about it. If you look at what uh, what uh, you know, proper, uh, Christendom is, is thought about these things, it's. It's embarrassing. It's it's uh, it's sad. This is what it is. So then, of course, you have uh, Acts uh, chapter ten, where uh, you know the the unclean animals were lowered down in the sheet, and uh, it says kill and eat. And Peter's like, no, you know, I've never touched that stuff ever because he was totally kosher, uh, Torah obedient. Um, and this dream, this vision, comes down three times, uh, and everybody wants to say, see, you know, this is this is. The backup proof for what Jesus said in, in Mark that, uh, you know, he's saying, don't call unclean what I've called clean. Well, first of all, you'll see nowhere in the, in the, in the Bible that God ever called those meats clean. Um, but what I don't understand is how people can read Acts 10 and miss what the true vision of it was. I mean, uh, well, before I give my opinion, what, what would you say about the, uh, the Acts 10 vision? Well, you got sound bite theology going on. I mean, that's how, how people are using it. You know, half the people who are quoting that sound bite, um, you know, probably haven't actually read the entire thing. Um, you know, they are at the disadvantage and confusion on, on the translation. But uh, you know, look at the. Uh, I guess I'm I'm kind of uh, a small tangent here, but the the point with uh, you know they they hand out New Testaments, you know, beginning with what Matthew, and it, it talks about Adam and Moses and stuff like that. I mean. If you don't have that beginning of the context, you know how can you possibly hope to define anything? So, you're getting in the difference between clean and unclean, or in this case, uh, you've got uh, you know common and unclean. You know, you've got a state of of handling versus a state of of can never be clean, uh, like a, a a car windshield. You can you can clean a car windshield, but you can never clean a squish bug. A squish bug. <laughs> Is, is always going to be unclean by nature of, of what it is. It's it's a, a biological offense, and, and that's getting into the definition and meaning of sin. Really, if you're not if you're not dealing with the idea that you know sin is an offense as opposed to a deliberate moral wrongdoing, you know I can uh, I can uh, you clean the litter box out barehanded and, and shake your hand, uh, not intending to do anything, you know, to you. Well, my intent is irrelevant because I have. I've offended you. There's there's offensive things that are in there. They're, they can make you sick. Um, so with with that that contrast, and Peter saying that now, go go back to the Acts thing where if Peter is saying, uh, you know, Jesus declared, or I'm sorry, if if they're saying Jesus declared all foods clean, well, that was while he was alive, and so now you got this time between uh, between Jesus or Yeshua saying that and and when uh, that that point Acts is, you know post-resurrection and so you have to tell me you know why is it that he disobeyed uh you know the, the mark 7 permission hmm. up until that point in time i mean nobody nobody can answer that one for me who's in the in the business of bacon frying etc i mean that's that's uh that's an important uh you know, detail. You know, surely not, Lord. I never put anything clean in my, my mouth. I mean, that's that's him echoing the same words as, as Ezekiel said when he was, uh, you know, told to cook his food over human excrement. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I love the way you you worded that. You know, this uh, cherry picking because uh, Acts ten seventeen. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, in other words, he was really confused by it. And, and you'll note that he didn't eat anything. He never, he never did reach into the sheet and grab a pig and start eating it. Uh, so he's like, you know, wait a minute. I know what I've been taught. I know what the Torah says. And yet, what, what am I looking at here? What am I? What's the deal? And then all of a sudden, and of course, he's got the vision three times, right? Three visions, and then all of a sudden, three men show up at his door. 
<laughs> and so, and, and as if you, if, if you miss the point of that, it tells you point blank in verse 28, and he said unto them, you know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. I mean, it tells you the interpretation of the vision right there in Acts ten twenty eight. Absolutely, amen. It's uh, yeah. Another thing about that vision with these these animals from heaven, you know, if if Peter is is seeing all types of animals, and you know, that's my understanding. Uh, excluding fish, right? I don't think there's any fish coming down on the on the sheet. Um, but you you have this this idea that there's uh, a difference between uh, defiled or common um, and unclean. So going back to this idea that you can make clean meat un, unclean. Let's take a, a T-bone steak. A T-bone steak is clean. Well, guess what? If I well, I should I maybe say tenderloin because it's more common. Uh, you know, if you wrap that thing with a piece of bacon, well, guess what? You're taking uh, you're taking a clean meat and you're defiling that meat. And so, if you're penning up a pig with a cow, you know that this is I think in part why Peter is is making that that point of distinction, or he's he's got the and in there. I won't eat anything unclean, you know, common or defiled or unclean. So there's there's something that's Again, incapable of ever being clean, uh, that which is distinct from something that is potentially, you know, that was clean and has become dirty or, or defiled. And you're defiling things, again, biologically here. Yeah, you know, some people think, well, what are you harping on this for? I mean, what's the big deal? I'm like, well, I mean, should we obey God or not? And, you know, his laws... Um, aren't there for him to just, you know, be a big meanie and not let us have our, our, you know, bacon fun or whatever. I mean, he put these things there for our benefit. He knows what's good for us and what's bad for us. And what I found really interesting in, uh, as kind of a sidebar in my Nephilim research and transhumanism and genetics and, uh, you know, blending of species and all that stuff is the, the, the creation of Enviro pig. Because, uh, I mean, like I said, even secular scientists know and understand that it's toxic. So they were trying to, to make a less toxic pork, basically, mm-hmm. a less toxic pig. So they genetically modified the pig with mouse DNA. Now, what really caught my attention about that is in a end times context, in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 17, God's mad here, in verse 16, for fi- for. By fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Okay, so God's ticked off here, right here. Verse 17. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh, the abomination, and the mouse, shall be consumed mm. together, saith the Lord. So, right there, it's talking about swine's flesh and the mouse. How, um, like, this, like, come on, really? I mean, here it is in, in the evening news. And we're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, and my guest tonight is Andrew Hoy. Right before the break, we were talking about the issue of clean and unclean foods and things of that nature, and I was actually bringing out Isaiah 66:17 and talking about transhumanism, how uh, the transhumanists and people who are messing around with genetically modified organisms trying to create a less toxic pig, blended pig, DNA with mouse DNA, and here you have right here in an apocalyptic end times context in the book of Isaiah, chapter 17, talking about those who are eating swine's flesh and the mouse shall be consumed together. I just, I mean, like, wow, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think uh, that that transhumanism thing is, is a real spooky danger. I mean, you got uh, early Genesis saying, Everything was created what according to its kind. You said uh, you know later in the Torah it says don't mix two types of seed. Um, I mean, never mind the, the species. This well, I shouldn't say the, the species. The species, of course, that Monsanto is is in the business of of doing uh, 
uh, making basically uh, uh, herbicide uh, resistant uh, crops and um, you know they're mixing the bacteria or, or what have you and with the the actual um, actual you know plant plant type plant DNA uh, to make it basically poison resistant and uh, you know what is that really doing doing to your body I mean that's uh, um, you know, there's a reason again we, we eat certain things and we don't eat certain other things it's, it's biological response it's it's uh it's a certain as no I don't say gravity but <laughs> it's <laughs> it's repeatable as gravity is it seems to be but uh, anyway yeah well I mean we've we've kind of gone down a little bit of a rabbit trail here it's not the the purpose of tonight's broadcast is not to talk about the uh, the food issues though I do think it's really important maybe I'll have to have you come back on again but if people are more uh want want to know more if they're interested in this topic uh uh, tell us a little bit more about your book and where people can get it. Well, I just uh, want to throw out a couple of points, you know, on our um, uh, thread thread on our conversation there. Uh, you know, love does no harm to its neighbor, um, and they say all the commandments sum into the ten. Well, if if you got all of them summing into the ten, what is one of the ten? Thou shalt not kill. Hmm. And so, if if you're if you're feeding someone stuff that's uh, carcinogenic and you know, uh, laden with um, you know, parasites and, and, and toxins and stuff like that. Well, guess what? You're you're harming your neighbor. Um, you know, it says, says in Romans, without uh, without the law, we wouldn't know what sin is. And you know, that's apparently the case because we're, we don't even have the common sense to listen to a, you know what science says about it. We said, no, Jesus declared it clean. So, um, so anyway, the book is unique in that. It's the only work that I'm aware of that can prove uh, uh, an, uh, a dispensational view. So the dispensationalist said, you know, God has changed from this period to that period to this period. And I, I go into uh, Genesis 1, Genesis 9, uh, and all the other uh, New Testament texts uh, to, to prove it's a common thread. It's the same, uh, it's the same instruction. So uh, that's uh, available on Amazon and, and uh, um, yeah, called uh, Eat Like Jesus. Okay, so the book is called Eat Like Jesus by Andrew Hoy, and it is avail- available on Amazon. Well, um, yeah, so that's not what the package that you sent me in the mail was about. It was about something entirely different, um, the tabernacle, the tabernacle in the wilderness uh, specifically, uh, given during the time of the Exodus. And uh, it's something I've always been fascinated ab- about, so... Uh, for the sake of our audience that may not be familiar with the tabernacle, um, why don't you kind of, what is the tabernacle, where do we find it in the Bible, and uh, just kind of give us a, a sort of a, a background history of what the tabernacle is. Okay, let me, let me be uh, completely frank and honest here. Um, you know, you said you're, you're always fascinated by it. Well, I can say this uh, wholeheartedly and honestly, I wasn't. <laughs> I, didn't, huh. I didn't care much about it. Um, you get into the, the question of, of okay, well, what, what does this what does this mean today? Why why should we even look at it? So, uh, again, I was I was only studying something else, and that something else was a cherub, and it was the, the word cherub was you know, tied into mention of the Exodus, uh, the curtains. Okay, so I started looking at the the curtains because they they contained uh, you know Hebrew word uh, for cherub, and um, I was wondering what the the physical you know construction layout of, of these were because it's talk uh, Exodus twenty six uh, one through uh, well maybe I'm getting ahead of myself as far as what the uh, uh, what the tabernacle was all about so a- after the Egyptian exodus you know let my people go you got Israel the whole you know horde of Israel comes out of, of Egypt and parked at Mount Sinai and uh, they're basically told uh, okay now that you're out. Uh, you know, have uh, make a make a tabernacle for me here, um, and this is why they were just, uh, told to, to get out of Egypt, or, or the, the, as far as what Pharaoh was told. Um, uh, he said, uh, "Let my people go, so that they may hold a, a festival to me in the wilderness." You know, so this is the part of the core purpose that was explained to Pharaoh of, of why these people were supposed to come out. And so, okay, come out, make me a tabernacle. So the tabernacle, you know, starting with uh, Exodus 25, talking about the, the materials they started uh, staging and everything, uh, collecting raw materials. And then uh, they also left, of course, with the spoils of Egypt, uh, you know, a lot of uh, gold and, and uh, fabrics and 
uh, you know, nice things, basically. Um, and um, Exodus 26 then starts getting into the actual mechanics on, on how the tabernacle was to be built. And again, I, I never really cared about it, you know, even you know, being an engineer, I'm like, oh, well, yeah, it's, it's a building, whatever. I mean, a mechanical engineer, not a, an architectural or structural engineer. So it's like, okay, well, building's a building. You know, it just sits there. Uh, engineering joke is, is like this, that uh, mechanical, I'm sorry, that civil engineers, uh, mechanical engineers build bombs and civil engineers build targets. So um, <laughs> yeah. that's always the Trump in college anyway. So, um, so with this being just a stationary thing, it's like, well, a mechanical guy, like some movement in my stuff or, or what have you. So well, I start reading this and it, I guess it's the, the technical, you know, getting into the, the Hebrew things because I, I know from, you know, I've, I've been duped so many times in, in bad translations in, in reading it and coming up with a, you know, what I think is a viable doctrine you know, based on the translations. Um, and that this is what caused me to have to rewrite my, my book so many times is because it's like, okay, well, I was using English. I have to not use English and get back to the original languages. Uh, so Exodus 26 starts with these these uh, curtains. It talks about two sets of uh, curtains they're making for the, the tabernacle, and nobody really cares about curtains. Who, who? Why would anyone care about curtains? They're, I mean, that's more boring than a building, right? Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I, I start looking at the dimensions, and one of the curtain sets uh, they're making, they're making 11 curtains. Uh, I should look at the first one first. Uh, they're making 10 curtains, uh, 28 by 4. Uh, that's in I want to say Exodus uh, one through six, and then Exodus uh, seven through twelve or thirteen. Uh, it's then talking about the the wool ones, which are uh, four by thirty, and there's eleven of those being made. And so the text is talking about how uh, the one set is and how the other set is, and it seems to have a description of how one is kind of relative to another. And that's that's kind of where I, I start on this discovery here. So. Um, you know, there's the question of how do these things lay out, and you know, conventional wisdom says this, this whole tabernacle is a rectangular thing. You've seen all the pictures. Um, you know they've got actual you know live uh, practice models here in the U.S. out of California, out of Oklahoma, and say Arkansas um, and Israel. They've they've had uh, one near Jericho. They got one uh, Timna near uh, Elat, which is down by the Red Sea. Um, so th- there's a number of these things that have been physically, you know, constructed and modeled, and basically everyone makes them rectangular. Um, I, I personally think it, it's it's laid out rectangular because they they didn't follow the instructions to the letter, and um, I think uh, this is this is where everything has been uh, lost in translation. Well, okay, so. This is really interesting. So it's funny how God will send people on a path <laughs> that can radically change their life in many cases. So you're intrigued by the cherubim. The cherubim show up on the curtains. You're looking at the curtains, and all of a sudden you're impressed uh, to try to start laying this stuff out, probably as the, you know, the engineer in you, I guess, is looking at you – know, I shop at Ikea. You know, um, and if anybody's ever shopped at Ikea, you know, you get the furniture and you you open the box up and it's all these boards and little inserts you put in the boards and these little pegs. Some are wooden, some are metal that twist and go into the inserts. And, you know, if you don't do it exactly right, I mean, it's a nightmare. So I I can kind of just see you, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but did you start looking at Exodus 23, or 26, excuse me, and just see like a parts list and say, okay, how does this go together? Well, I, I really started with, with just these curtains, and uh, it was, I guess, uh, observation on the curtains. It, it was it was how they go together. I actually started looking at the web, um, you know, seeing how this these two curtain sets were and, and kind of the cherubim and the significance of the cherubim. And I, I, I look at, um, you know, all these different images, and, and everyone's got a different story and you know, different take on it. And... Um, Basically, they make one sheet that's, I want to say, 42 by 30, and then the other one is, uh, I guess, 28 by uh, by 40. And you know, it talks about folding one in half and and, um, and overlapping, you know, moving it to by about a cubit. And, and so I'm looking at all these descriptions and looking at they're all they're all different. And, and then I, I start looking at more of these layouts, and they're they're all different. And I just, again, intuitively know I, I can't look at the English because I can't trust it. Um, and, I mean, I, I spent, I, I wasted a lot of time in, in writing the, uh, uh, 
you know, the, the kosher book um, because I thought there was a distinction between uh, clean and ceremonially clean and, and, and unclean and ceremonially unclean. You see, this is another, you know, add-in by translators, you know, to, uh, for, for their own doctrinal uh, ambitions and, and whatnot. So I thought there was an actual distinction in, in some of that. And you start researching it in original languages as a nope. And uh, it's a similar thing. So, you know, there's just a whole bunch of things in the description, in the, in the frame and, and everything like that. Where, where they they they're describing particular shapes in English, and you know the text doesn't speak to these shapes and, and getting into the dimensions. Well, there's a lot of unspecified dimensions um, that you know you you've, you've got to fill in the gaps because otherwise, um, you know, it's uh, you know, some sometimes the lengths are are not given. Sometimes you're only given a weight of material, uh, in t- total amount of uh, unit weight to work with. You know, but the items are all there, so it's almost like taking a, a Lego set and, and dumping it out on the uh, or the IKEA and, and dumping it out uh, of the original package, only to find uh, more boxes, more containers where you don't know what's inside them. You know, you might know what some of them weigh, but you don't know how them are, any of them are shaped. You know, so you can shake the box around all you want until you you uh, bust it open. You, you really can't get there. In, in this case, you can't really you know, bust them open by descriptions. Uh, like, for example, the roof. There's, there's no dimensions given to the roof. The roof is made of leather, uh, which stands to reason because, hey, it's a tent. That's what you, you use a canvas-type tent. You know, uh, leather stops the, the rain from falling through, and that's why you don't use the linen or the wool you know, for the, the, the roof. Is you use leather. And uh, for, the, for the leather top, you know, there, there's, zero, there's zero dimensional specifications. It says it, it's got to, the description is it's got to cover the whole tent. So, you know, when you look at that, that's, uh, um, you know, this, this is where they start, you know, filling in the gaps with, with what they do. And, you know, they, they've got the, uh, they start with the, the wrong uh, orientation on, on a lot of their hardware. And that's why, in, in my opinion, they come up with the, the wrong the wrong overall description. So, uh, you know, I've, I've always seen the rectangular depiction of the tabernacle. Um, you know, lot, there's always some artist's representation of it uh, that we see over and over and over again. So, like, but th- there seems to be variants of it. Can you describe some of the variants that uh, have been out there on the rectangular shape? They're not always depicted the same way. Yeah, um, you know, some of them are shown kind of like uh, A-frame. I want to say the Holman Bible, the uh, uh, Jewish Encyclopedia, you know, they show kind of like uh, what's very similar to an A-frame roof. And uh, part of it, you can understand why they would go there, because um, most people have figured out by now a flat roof tent doesn't work so well. You know, you end up having a big, you know, uh, rain collection tarp in in the end. But, uh, uh, and... As far as the uh, the corners, they don't know what to do with some of the corners. Uh, you, you start looking at the, the fence posts and uh, how how high they are, and, and as far as what they're made of, you know, they're they're basically not uh, they're, they're not paying close attention to what the text gives you to work with. So you know, the text is kind of giving you a, a material list, and um, but it's again expressed in a in a fill in a fill in the gaps type thing and it's it's really after i found you know found out that what i think the real design is it's it's really a matter of uh, economy of language it's it's saying so much all at once and it's having you you know put in the the uh the details and this is why the curtain dimensions are so important is because the uh you know it, it starts dictating the remainder of the uh, hardware geometry, or I shouldn't say the remainder, much of the, the either the, the hardware geometry itself or the layout of that uh, geometry. So for you, that's uh, like everything really depends on how you orient the curtains. Is there, I mean, is there more than one way? or like? Sure. Well, it's, it says to connect them all edge to edge. And when I say edge to edge, and it's, and they're, all, uh, they're all fitted with loops. Okay, so when you have a sheet that, w- that measures four, uh, maybe a, you know, four cubits by 30 cubits, and a cubit uh, depends upon which standard you want to use. I mean, it's a material to, to you know, why, what I've come for conclusions on my design. 
you know, anywhere between, you know, 15, 18, 21, 25 inches for a cubit. So uh, if you're using, let's say, a 25-inch cubit, a, a sheet or a curtain that they're making is, is 30 cubits long. So that's, say, 60 feet. So 8 feet tall by, by 60 feet uh long or wide. I mean, this is a, this is a big piece of fabric. I mean, if you can imagine the loom that they're going to, they're going to, to make this thing on. I mean, this is, you know, I, I say that this is a highly engineered uh, component because there's, there's more detail given uh, regarding these, these uh, tabernacle curtains than there is the, uh, the entire, uh, uh, the, the entire Ark of the Covenant. And so you have to ask the question, what's, why are these, these, these strange details you know, so important? Make it with 50 loops and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it, in conventional uh, models, they, they basically they treat them like drapes. They toss them over, mm-hmm. and then they, they start, uh, you know, connecting them to things, um, you know, contrary to what the Torah says. Yeah, so uh, in the conventional model, it's sort of it's an afterthought. Okay, when you, once you build this thing, throw these over the top of it. Um, but you're saying, no, this is mentioned the way it's mentioned because it determines the actual overall shape and function of it, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So, but but they're uh, made of different types of um, different types of skins, and, and there's one that's always kind of perplexed me, and that's 26 Exodus 26:14, um, where King James says covering of badger skins. But, I mean, if you just do a parallel Bible on, this is one of those reasons why I, I value the parallel Bible model where you, you compare translations because you're looking at, uh, well, the NIV just says durable leather. Okay, that's cool. The New Living says ram skins and goat skins. English Standard says goat skins. The New American Standard says porpoise. Uh, <laughs> then you get uh, manatee in the Holman Christian Standard. You get dolphin. And the international standard, I mean, there's a big difference between a porpoise and badgers. <laughs> I mean, so yeah. what's going on here? Well, between Flipper and Moby Dick, right? Oh, or um, seal skin in the JPS Tanakh 1917. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I don't think they killed Flipper or Moby, uh, you know, Moby Dick when they were... In the desert. How are you going to get uh, yeah. porpoise skin in the, in the middle of the desert? So, you know, if if you look at you start into Exodus 25, which is where this materialist start. You know, it's it's described uh, the offerings that they're bringing is this teruma. Well, uh, the Hebrew uh, ram basically. You know, this is where we get our. I think the name of, of the, the ram animal, the ram truck. You know, something on high. Look at a ram stands up on its hind legs. A ram, you know, walks around on a on a uh, on a mountaintop and everything like that. So you you have the uh, you, the the etymology. I think is uh, of uh, the English ram, I mean, it won't tell you that when you look on these etymology searches, all the Hebrew roots of you know, so many English words. Um, but getting into this this principle of clean and unclean, well, guess what? Um, they're not told they, they can eat fish with fins and scales. They can eat flipper. You know, flipper's not allowed. Same thing with the manatees and and uh, badgers and, and all that. These are unclean animals. You know, don't cut them open on purpose. Uh, you know, because they're they're stu- they they have biological things that you do not want to expose yourself to, and and that's you know part of of what's going on. So, with from from the Hebrew, from from what I can tell, we're we're talking either um, you know ram and or uh, or deer skins, and I think they were using the two uh, because of the different properties of of these uh, different animals. Okay, so, you know, the, the question would be then is are they using clean or unclean skins on the most holy thing, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, that's going to contain the presence of God? Yeah, I mean, tanning is, is not a, a pretty business, um, but, you know, the same, same as like Ezekiel was, was allowed to, uh, you know, cook his food over, over, uh, over cow dung. And guess what? Cow dung is, is uh, it's regarded as clean uh, according to the Bible. Why? Because... Uh, car, cows are herbivores. They eat only grass, and they leave the the, the patty behind, uh, like in kind. And they have the you know the, the stomachs, the uh, you know chewing the cud, et cetera, et cetera. So this is another criteria for the clean animal. Well, uh, the the end product. So you, you know the, the hockey pucks on the ground uh, left behind. We're, we're talking. Uh, uh, you can use that as fuel. Um, and if you actually look at the heat content, um, it's it's better than a lot of woods, and it's. it's it's somewhere, uh, you know, pound for pound, it, it rates up there with, with uh, 
uh, coal, like a mid-grade coal as far as BTU content. So it's a, it's a handy fuel. I mean, if, if you've got grazing animals, uh, if you can imagine 2 million Israelites cruising out of Egypt and uh, walking around with cows and, and, uh, and uh, you know, they, they had flocks and herds. And so if these flocks and herds, you know, they got to eat something, they got to eat grass. And so I don't think they're, you know, they're in a forest, you know, they're, they're on, they're on the plains somewhere. And, uh, you know, if they're whatever grazing they're doing. So if you can imagine how, how much uh, wood for cooking uh, a, a, a group of 2,000, I'm sorry, 2 million people, well, you know, how much fuel they're going to need. Well, you've got a re- really nice grass converter where it's essentially converting grass to firewood. You're not looking at, um, you know, uh, lots of sticks after your first few days in town. If, if you're grabbing all the wood, some of the wood for utility and the rest of it, uh, you're going to be burning it up pretty quick. So it's your contention then that whatever that other skin was, it's it's not going to be an unclean animal, but it's going to be a clean animal. Yeah, I mean they would have they would have had to have uh, you know, between flocks and herds. They would have had plenty you know leather by themselves. You know, try to get uh, leather off of what a, a dolphin or a, or a uh, uh, manatee or whatever compared to say a you know, a bull or a, a ram or, or what, what have you. I mean, uh, you know, what's, what's naturally occurring in the, in the area? Um, and what do you, uh, what do you domesticate? What can you corral? All that kind of stuff. It's, uh, I mean, the, the translators are, are, you know, they openly admit, I want to say the NIV says uh, flora and, and fauna, you know, the, um, the, the animals and the, the plant types are saying, well, we don't really know entirely what it is. And, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, fight on a hill, you know, but I personally think, uh, you know, between rams and uh, and uh, deer or or gazelle, you know, something like that. Uh, this is this is the animal types we're, we're talking, uh, you know, between in that region that's available. That's, you know, you got so many people there, and, and with the flocks and herds, um, that's not that much leather to procure, I guess. So yeah. why would you do something that ridiculous? So. Well, yeah, and and when you're out in the the desert of Arabia, Mount Sinai. Uh, I can't imagine you're going to find too many dolphins or, or uh, yeah. you know, seals or anything like that. So, but in the traditional model that you know most of us have seen, either that course kind of the A-frame, or more commonly, uh, I've seen more of a just a rectangular box with uh, all. I mean, when you look at how much fabric is is told to them to uh, to to uh, create. You, it seems like they just say, well, they must be stacked on top of each other. So you got uh, linen with goat hair on top of the linen and, and uh, red dyed ram skin on top of the goat hair and then badger, you know, porpoise or whatever <laughs> on top of that. I mean, is, is that why they decide it must be four on top of each other because they just have so much of it? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, if you look, if you look at the chronology, you know, Exodus uh, twenty six one through six, it's talking about the linen. Uh, then it, it talks about and to, to cover the tent. Is uh, next up is is the uh, the wool. Uh, then it, it makes mention in uh, twenty six, uh, I think fourteen or thirteen. I think it's fourteen. Uh, of the the basically the the reddened leather, uh, which seems to be the third layer. Then then the fourth. Uh, which is the the one on top, which isn't described as red, and, and I would contend that, you know, they weren't trying to make it, uh, you know, a particular color. We're talking about tanning. I mean, red is uh, um, uh, basically the the word that that is used is derived from like Adam and uh, Adam, uh, Adama, you know, earth. You know, it's it's uh, it's red, and this is this is what the tanning part is. To me, it seems to be described in the tanning process. I mean, when you use tan in from trees. You know, you're, you're getting stuff from uh, tree bark, you know, chemicals from tree bark. Uh, you, you're getting that. It's in astringent and it's uh, antibacterial, et cetera. So it's, it's uh, toughening up the leather and it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's you know, curing it in some way. So, you know, to, to me, this is what, that, what they think is the third layer is. Now, why, uh, if you're going to have the upper layer on top, why would you have that one untreated? And then the other one, I don't care if you think it's colored or... You know, if it's treated like you know tanning, um, you know, why would you put that underneath the the outer layer? I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, the other thing that doesn't make sense is it looks like you got this blending thing where you know we're not supposed to blend wool and linen, and yet you've got those two laying right on top of each other in in this model here. And um, yeah. actually, we don't have time to go into that right now. We're about ready to go to break, but when we come back from break, I would like you to uh, to address that if you would. Okay. 
All right, and uh, we'll be back shortly. Chris Gio here, founder of Truth Frequency Radio. On November 5th, GFR will be six years old, and with every anniversary, this is a time for great reflection. As an avid listener of talk radio myself, I got sick and tired of listening to talk networks that were created for the sole purpose of trying to sell me snake oil. When I found out that the hosts are actually contractually obligated to disguise advertisements in the form of their news stories, I knew that I couldn't trust alternative media any more than the mainstream. That's when I knew I had to build TFR as an ad-free and 100% listener-supported station. My personal promise to you is that when you listen to TFR, you'll always be able to trust what you hear. You can be part of this media paradigm shift right now by becoming a TFR supporter today and letting the corporate-controlled media know that the message is far too important to dilute in hidden advertisements and hidden agendas. Together, we are TFR, your protection from deception. The Zevites follow a fake messiah. He preaches the opposite of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal becomes thou shall steal. Thou shalt not kill becomes thou shall kill. The Zevites have killed millions. The great fire of London was the inferno they deliberately created to honor the crowning of their king Shabbatai, an evil fake messiah crowned in the year 1666. The Enigma Channel, EnigmaTV.com Intelligent Television for Planet Earth. Visualize an infinite hologram of unconditional love above your head. This is a holographic sphere with the flower of life pattern infinitely expanding inwardly to infinity. The all-new Sacred Geometry Shop has arrived, featuring eight of the world's most renowned sacred geometry and visionary artists. The mission of SGS is to embed sacred geometry art, frequencies, and equations into all conventional products in order to raise the vibration and help heal one's own individual life. Products include art, canvas prints, skateboards, galaxy and iPhone cases, clothing, hats, jewelry, home decor, yoga mats, and a new sacred geometry skincare line. Enter the word star seed for an additional 25% discount. Log on today to Sacred SacredGeometryShop.com and feel the vibration. This, this is Truth Frequency Radio. The wicked ones obviously under heavy, heavy Masonic influence. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I'm your host, Rob Skiba. For the second hour of the broadcast, I'm talking with my guest, Andrew Hoy, and we were discussing uh, some of the potential problems with the traditional design and layout of the tabernacle uh, that the Israelites had in the wilderness after the, the time of the Exodus there um, from Egypt. And uh, right before the break, we were talking about specifically the issue of, of wool and linen and, you know, we've got a command right here in Leviticus 19.19. 19, you shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. Neither shall a garment be mingled of linen and wool come upon thee. And yet here we have linen and wool stacked right on top of each other on the most holy place uh, 
at the time anyway, <laughs> in existence. W- w- I mean, what's your take on that? Yeah, <clears throat> like you said, it, it's uh, you have to question it. Some people would say, well, that's not mixing if you're if you're putting one layer over the other. But I don't know anyone who's, who's thrown uh, different materials in a dryer and has watched the amount of static. I mean, <laughs> This is this is we're, we're talking grade school uh, science experiments. You know, get the glass rod and the rubber rod, the metal rod, and you rub this one on wool and this one on cotton and this one. You know, so it's, it's obvious you're, you're doing something. You know, in the electrostatic world. You know, I guess the other the other realms I I would tend to wonder about is electrochemical. You got you know sweat, the pH of sweat. Um, you know what what's going on uh, in the body, body chemistry. I mean, the body is a, a biochemical engine to some degree, right? And uh, we we have to wonder what's uh, what's behind it. I mean, I've seen a lot of people uh, offer different uh, views. I mean, Deuteronomy twenty one twenty one. I'm looking at uh, do not wear wool, uh, clothes of wool and linen uh, woven together. You know, some people um, you know aren't uh, that's how would I say, um, you know, they have, they have differing opinions on the fabrics, um, you know, whether or not you can wear synthetic blends and all that. But, um, you know, I, I see this this whole thing is like, you know, if God knows more than we do, let's let's err on a side of caution and not not be, you know, mixing these fabrics. I mean, the, the, the mixing the seeds, mixing... You know, all these things. Um, I look at the, these things under a microscope. Uh, not not me myself, but I'm talking. You know, Google Image or something. And, and uh, one thing that really fascinated me when I was when I was studying out the fabrics uh, it possibly used in these things is uh, the the fabric structures of, of some of the uh, the plants. You know, tend to resemble uh, Birkeland currents, which um, you know is just basically twisted pairs of, of electricity. You know, plasma plasma flow. And so, you know, my question I would ask is, uh, you know, is is this a, uh, you know, an electrical? You know, we don't, we don't typically think of of uh, plant life conducting electricity, but you know, obviously, it's it's, it's shaped uh, and it takes on the same shapes as some of this. If if you look at the tree and uh, you look at the root pattern above and below, and you compare that to uh, you know, uh, lightning clusters and everything, it's it's striking how how similar these things are. So. You know, it seems to be you know the path of uh, you know, of electricity flow. When I look at it, that's that's what I see. So yeah, there's a there's a website uh, people can check out if they're interested in this whole issue. Uh, it's called lifegivinglinen dot com. I'm just gonna read the first paragraph on the the page. It says linen dash study dot html. In 2003, a study was done by a Jewish doctor Heidi Yellen on the frequencies of fabric. According to this study, the human body has a signature frequency of 100, and organic cotton is the same, 100. The study showed that if the number is lower than 100, it puts a strain on the body. A diseased, nearly dead person has a frequency of about 15, and that is where polyester, rayon, and uh, silk register. Non-organic cotton registers a signature frequency of about 70. However, if the fabric has a higher frequency, it gives energy to the body. This is where linen comes in as a super fabric. Its frequency is 5,000. Wool is also 5,000, but when mixed together with linen, the frequencies cancel each other out and fall to zero. Even wearing a wool sweater on top of a linen outfit in a study collapsed the electrical field. The reason for this could be that the energy field of wool flows from left to right, while that of linen flows in the opposite direction from right to left. So, I mean, when we consider the tabernacle, and, and specifically the Ark of the Covenant, that's inside of the tabernacle, which, uh, you know, I think we could make a really good um, argument for saying it has electrical properties to it. Uh, I mean, this whole thing appears to have electrical properties to it. So why would you put something that has uh, counterproductive uh, frequencies right on top of each other? Yeah, you know, I don't know. Um, you're talking about the uh, you know the frequencies of 5,000 and 100, you know, for the other things. that I, I tend to... Uh, you know, I, I'm a guy who likes to cancel my units, so if I don't see an engineering unit there, I kind of freak out. And I, I haven't studied this in, in the hugest amount of detail, but some of this is it gets to a, a matter of just conviction and belief. And I, I've heard people do studies like that. Uh, I err on the side of believing them because um, uh, it, it gets into the whole X-ray thing. Uh, when I say X-ray thing, 
before they discovered x-rays, as far as we knew, there weren't such a thing. You know, do we have a ghostometer? Can we measure, you know, <laughs> when I say ghosts in, in that, things in outside of our normal realm of perception, you know, our vision is such and such, well, birds see better, our hearing is such and such, well, dogs hear better, so if something is, is oscillating at 30,000, 40,000 hertz, it's outside of the threshold of human hearing, but that that doesn't mean it doesn't make a sound. So if the tree falls in the forest and it lands at 40,000 hertz, mm -hmm. do we hear it? And the answer is no, but it doesn't make it sound, and the answer is yes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I take this this frequency study in, in a similar thing. I, I think there's things uh, uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum that, that we just haven't had the... Uh, the insight and the wherewithal or the, the, the metrology, you know, the, the, the gizmos to read the, um, uh, the, the parameters, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the levels, the power levels and, and the, uh, the intensities, frequencies, um, the phases, the, uh, you know, things in, of whatever someone might call alt, other dimensional, you know, so I, I just, yeah, our, our known science doesn't know everything. It's it's naturalistic. Most scientists are, are kind of like naturalistic physicists, or into naturalistic or materialistic physics. Saying you know, it's it's a religious worldview they have. They start with the idea that um, you know we're just a bunch of uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons, and we're just you know chemical uh, you know chemical machines, that, and, and only that. And there's no ghost in the machine. And therefore, in a sense, we say, well, we don't have free will anymore because I'm just a product of my uh, upbringing and my chemical reactions, however that all works out. I mean, that's, that's the, the implications of that. It's, it's a ridiculous worldview. I mean, to say that there's nothing acting on our minds that's uh, outside our body, I think it's just it's kind of childish. Well, I yeah, um, again, it goes to God created all this stuff. So he knew what he was doing, and he knew what, just like the food issue. You know, uh, he, he knew how he created certain animals, he knew how he created the human body, and knew what would interact well with our body and give us energy and, and you know, be good for us, and what would be a negative uh, influence on our body if we ate it. And so, you know, it's the same thing. It's like, is, is God against your favorite polyester outfit? Well, I mean, he, it, it's, if, if, this, if he put inherent frequencies in organic stuff and inorganic stuff and whatnot, and, and, and our bodies are electrical then it makes sense that he would give us guidelines on what to wear and what not to wear and what to blend and what not to blend, uh, you know, as, as, in terms of what we use on our body to keep the frequencies uh, uh, in the positive realm as opposed to, you know, canceling it out or sucking it down or giving you a low uh, frequency. I don't understand all that stuff either. I just I look at the stuff, I read it and go, okay, well, you know, that's interesting. But what intrigues me about what we're going to be getting into uh, as we move forward in this broadcast is, you know, a different idea concerning the construction of the tabernacle may, in fact, uh, affect the way, you know, if God says, make this out of this, make this out of that, make it so high, make it so wide, you know, he's got a reason for it. And if we look at the traditional rectangle model, um, you've pointed out uh, a number of structural problems with it uh, engineer, from an engineering perspective. I know you have about uh, 10 different bullet points or so. Uh, on the engineering problems of uh, of the tabernacle, can, so can you uh, just walk us through some of those? Okay, um, and and these these uh, I guess for point of reference are on my website, uh, which is uh, project three fourteen dot org, and um, I guess want to just start with uh, you know the the parallelogram, if you will. Um, a parallelogram, structurally speaking, is is awful, whereas a triangle is is excellent. Uh, what I mean by that is, is uh, you know, take take yourself a cardboard box. Uh, you know, take a, a long, like a refrigerator box, and you know, try to set anything, uh, you know, 10, 10, 15 pounds on it, and it's going to collapse. Uh, it, that square cross section, if you if you got the the long axis of the of the cardboard box, you know, parallel to the ground, so so the, the refrigerator box is laying down. Um, and you're putting a weight on it with a you know with an open end, and this is how the rectangular model is, is kind of comparable to. Uh, it's got a open end at the east, at the east side. Well, with with vertical poles, but you know they take on kind of that, that uh, you know, parallelogram thing. So a parallelogram, of course, is a, a four-sided uh, shape that has uh, you know the two opposing sides 
uh, always parallel. So, you know, if you can imagine, you know, pins at the corners, you know, that's kind of what's happening. It's collapsing, it's rotating. The, the sides, the lengths of, of those sides stay the same, uh, but it, it pivots around that, that, uh, that corner joint. And that corner joint, it, it becomes very hard to reinforce. It's, it's uh, you know, you get a lot of uh, torque uh, you know, generated at that spot, you know, force times the distance. And, um, you know, this is why, you know, it's just uh, you, you always need to put in something, you know, triangular to reinforce uh, so, so you're not uh, getting into that, uh, you know, the collapsing of that, of that geometry of that uh, square turning into essentially a parallelogram. Um, you know, to me, when I started to, to really think about this and look at that, that, that was a pretty, you know, no-brainer to me. It's like as a builder, you, you, just, you just wouldn't do that. And this is why you see on most of the models, you know, they're taking the, the, uh, the leather on top of the, uh, on top of the, the tabernacle that they're assuming, you know, the, the fourth layer level of la- layer of leather, and they are pulling it tight, uh, and they're, they're pulling it out, to, again, a little bit A-frame-like. And not all the models have this, but most of the models do. And uh, they do that in part to, to give this thing uh, lateral stability. Um, because if, if you don't have uh, something anchored down, it, it's like, uh, you know, like a big radio tower. They'll, they'll put the cables out, um, you know, in you know, the middle section, and then they'll, they'll, they'll pull that away, you know, uh, a few hundred feet from, from the base and, and anchored into the ground. Why? Because you're making these, these triangles, which, which cannot uh, bow and, and change. So you can't change the angle of a, of a triangle without trying to extend the length of, of the shape. And this is what the parallelogram, it allows the, the, the length of the sides to stay the same. And that's why it just, it just wants to topple. I mean, that's, that's the nature of, uh, that's the engineering behind that. It's, it's no, uh, nothing they didn't understand back, uh, you know, 4,000 years ago. It's, this is pretty obvious type stuff. Okay. So, in in that model, you got this. Uh, it's got three sides basically. It's got the two sides and, and the west side. The the east side's open, yep. other than some uh, some uh, pillars in the front. But it's yep. not. It's not. Those pillars are not connected to the sides. So I mean, structurally speaking, when you first put that thing up, uh, especially before you put the canopy over it, um, it's very unstable. I mean, if they've got any kind of uh, major wind going on, I mean. What's the wind going to do to a nice, big, long, flat surface like that? Well, exactly. It's it's a billboard effect. You know, it's uh, the amount of reinforcement you need on a on a billboard. It's it's notable because the wind loads. You know, they really start stacking up. Um, another thing you have to remember: these these beams are uh, uh, you, again depending upon your qubit standard and, and depending upon wh- how they interpret uh, certain. Oh, let's see. I um, can't think of which verse that is. I'll come in a second here. Um, these these big beams, and we're talking anywhere between uh, you know twelve hundred on, on the on the south end, and on, not, when I say south end, on the lowest end, and uh, six thousand, depending upon the size of your cubit. And if you're assuming these beams are you know cubit and a half by one, uh, one cubit by ten cubits, which is the conventional interpretation. You're looking at a you know beam of a few thousand pounds or uh, you know two three tons. Um, now I mean if you can imagine trying to to stand that that upright and then anchoring it into uh, you know a few hundred pounds of silver that's really not even in the ground. I mean it's it's just not the way you go about building things. I mean that's so one beam is how heavy? Uh, if, if you're looking at uh, ten cubits by. Uh, one and a half by one. Uh, that that's coming in, I think, around six thousand pounds. But if you're if you're using a smaller cubit, like a uh, a uh, twenty-one inch cubit or an eighteen inch cubit, it, it's more common to use an eighteen inch. It, it it decreases you know drastically, probably down to about two thousand pounds at that point. I don't have that. Uh, yeah, but that's two thousand pounds at a minimum for one board. And how many boards were they? Yeah, there's on the north side there's uh, 20 and the south side there's 20 as well. Okay, so first of all, they would have had to have found trees big enough to cut down and then shave into you know and, and with flush edges because they got to match up to each other, right? Right. Well, that's that's the whole thing. Um, you, know, you start looking at some of the the amount of precision you're trying to to make something uh, you know that big with. 
um, again with with uh, you know crude tools and, and you know they, they weren't unsophisticated back then. I, I want to re- really stress that. But the amount of you know controlled surface that you're going to need. Uh, you know, first of all, that putting putting uh, it's like putting studs in a wall. You see when people are doing uh, you know, framing out a house, they put a frame together. You know, with, with gaps between the, the, the between two by fours, and they do that because you don't make, need to make a wall solid of two by fours. No one in their right mind makes makes their house that way. I mean, even if people have all the money in the world, they they spend it elsewhere because mm-hmm. you know the wall only needs so much so much strength. And uh, if you start you know wasting your materials, all you do is you run up your costs. You run up, your, and, and sometimes you end up running into more problems. In this case, if you're trying to make a wall out of out of solid timbers like that, uh, again, shaving it down so they're all exact. And if you can imagine the amount of, uh, uh, you know, surface work that you need to do, you know, shaving down the, the thing so it's a, a perfectly level, uh, you know, playing field or, or, you know, foundation point. So you're well, trying yeah, to stack yeah. these things all exactly next to each other. The, you know, either you're trying to keep the thing closed or it's going to be, you know, whistling in the wind. And if it's whistling in the wind, you know, again, why are you... Why are you use, making uh, you know, big wood panels like that? It, it's it's uh, it's just short of prudent. Is is all I have to say on that? Well, it's extremely heavy. I mean, if you've got, I mean, how many boards total? You said. So, so you're looking at uh, 20 boards on the north, 20 on the south, and then they've got some uh, that they assume on the west. Um, you know, they assume six on the west, and then another. Uh, I want to say four by the Holy of Holies, and then they got. Uh, on the far east side, they got they got five. So, so um, about fifty-five boards of this size. Yeah, ballpark. Yeah. So figure. A, well, would say if we say a ton of piece, um, you know, that's a hundred tons right there. Wow, and and of course the assumption is building the box that they they you know obviously the bottom of the board needs to be shaved fl- flush so that it would fit into whatever uh, base that it's going into. And then both uh, sides of it, at least, would have to be flush. I mean, even if the the the, the front and back face of it isn't flush, that doesn't it wouldn't impact much, I don't think. But the 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 joining sides would have to be completely level, otherwise you wouldn't they would never join. You'd have just a big um, you know wind tunnel. Yeah, you know, um, conventionally they assume that, uh, and this is this is they, they do this from the text, and so this is kind of a uh, I wouldn't say a, a best guess. This is. This is like a religious person taking a text without having any, any building experience or, in some cases, you know, common sense or even, or even mastery of, of, of basic units. I mean, you know, there's pounds, there's inches, there's cubits, there's talents uh, as far as, you know, different units. So you've got to convert those, which isn't that hard. There's, there's some debate on, on different levels, but really the, the thing here is, is – uh, uh, you, you've got to you got to address your units and, and your your material quantities because if it says you only get two talents of, of silver per board, so you got all together that's maybe 150 pounds of silver. So you have to say, well, what's the density of silver? Silver is you know so many pounds per cubic inch. Uh, I want to say it's you know around ten uh, around ten times out of water. I mean, talking in terms of specific gravity. Uh, and so uh, 62.4 uh, is you know po- water pounds. So if you multiply that by by 10, you're looking at 600 pounds for uh, you know that's rough numbers. Maybe it's eight something for silver. I forget. Um, so if you're doing that, um, you know you're going to have uh, uh, as far as one one cubic foot is going to be you know weighing in at uh, at 600 some pounds. And so if you can imagine these 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 beams now, which they're assuming usually at a cubit and a half wide. Uh, again, this is um, anywhere between, uh, let's see, cubit and a half, um, 18, uh, let's, uh, say 27 inches, um, uh, 27, am I, no, I think I'm, I'm doing bad conversion on the fly there. So, uh, no, that's, that's okay. Um so that's more than 27 inches, and that's, uh, oh, for crying out loud, well, I can't. But, but at any rate, I mean, you're talking, this is completely and totally impractical. Uh, not to mention, I mean, to, to build something of that nature, I mean, what would you have to do for surface preparation? Yeah, well, um, nothing if you don't want the, the building to look like it's straight. I shouldn't say that because they, they end up assuming that there's, 
there's vertical poles that are uh, running the whole length of of the building that uh, a lot of times they assume that they're kind of uh, cored inside of, of these big beams. And so if you can imagine taking a big beam that's, uh, you know, a foot thick and, uh, you know, putting a big hole in it and then putting a, a long, long pole. So if you have uh, a total of 20, uh, 20 of these things stacked side by side um, that are one and a half cubits, that's uh, 30 cubits. So if we're going to take our 30 cubits and say that's, uh, if you say 18 inches, that's uh, it's 45 feet long. So if you can imagine stacking stacking boards side to side to side to side, you know, um, uh, for a total length, 20 boards at, at 45 feet, and making a hole that's completely lined up, you know, so, so you got to maintain that that hole that's that's lined through there. So this is again some of the other, you know, hardware that they don't get right and. Uh, um, you know they're not getting it right because because the curtains uh, basically they they start out you know laying out the curtains wrong. So well yeah, um, but I mean I mean if if these boards are supposed to be side by side flush to to create a, a wall in the north and the south and the, and the west, I mean they're going to have to do quite a bit of surface preparation to have a reasonably you know straight and and so the top's not all jaggy and you know I mean it seems like sure, a, sure. a nightmare for you know having to set it up like that. I mean, you've got, I don't want to run out of time here because I want to just go ahead and get to the punchline. Um, but if people want to check it out, they can go to uh, project314.org and, and the, there's a tab called design. And in, in that one, there's a link called outside the box. And, you know, we always talk about thinking outside the box. Well, you know, you kind of end your thesis here by saying, don't put God in a box. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of other interesting uh bullet points uh but the one that really kind of got to me because with the other research that i do and people have heard me say this i'm trying to take the bible literally i'm trying to be a bible literalist and especially when it comes to the torah because the torah says do not add to it and do not subtract from it i mean that it comes with a pretty hardcore command don't add to it don't subtract from it and when when I was first introduced to your materials, I had all the yeah, but questions, you know, well, yeah, but this, yeah, but that. But you had made a statement, and I don't know if you made it here or if it was elsewhere, but basically in order to to maintain this structure, in order for this structure to have any structural integrity, you've got to add a bunch of hardware not given in the itemized shopping list that uh, Betzalel was given from Moses. That's correct. Um and most of it amounts to like uh, ropes and stakes, and uh, this is where they, uh, you know, a lot of times they'll take that uh, top layer of leather and uh, they'll they'll pull it out a little ways, you know, at a forty-five degree angle from the side of the building, and and they'll they'll anchor it down by means of stakes. Well, anyone who's been camping knows that those are awful trip hazards. Anyone who's, uh, you know, I guess, set, setting them up too, that's going to want to, you know, cause the inside of the. Uh, uh, the, the the beams to want to you know, pull pull in sort of side so instead of being up and down they they start uh, mm-hmm. wanting it to cave in at the tops um, and then at the bottom you've got nothing to anchor again uh, what what is 150 pounds of silver doing at the bottom uh, but uh, you know, keeping the 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 uh, the the beams off the dirt I mean it, it doesn't add any real you know base restraint. And so, uh, why would you want to put put silver on the ground? And, and again, the the, the size. I, I was talking about the you know the the silver density. You know, is like hey, saying, hey, this is important because it it dictates how much material you can you can get at the base. You know, what kind of moment of inertia uh, in in terms of physics, um, uh, you know, engineering and material strength, etc. You know, how, how do you how do you mount these these bases on the on the ground? And some people say, well, these bases were buried. Again, you know, what do you what do you want to do burying silver? Why well, use silver if you're going to bury it? And if you are going to bury it, what what good does it do to to bury the the silver block? Because it really is not restraining anything. Because you barely have any silver to bury. You know, it's just well, and it's, it's just, not it's not you know the mass of it's not that much when you've got a, a ton on on top of it, or you know however right. however, however disproportionately heavy the uh, the wood is that's going into it. And you're right, if you're trying to stretch these heavy leather canvases over the top. I mean, they'd have to have all kinds of support structures on the inside to keep the walls from falling in on themselves. Yeah, you know, it's a little like taking a stake 
and, and pounding it about two, uh, you know, four foot stake, pounding it in, in, into the ground two, three inches and thinking that you can't, you know, push over the stake usually with uh, two fingers, you know. I mean, that's that's what we're talking about when we're talking about, you know, leverage and, and bottom restraint, you know. Okay, uh, hold that thought. And we're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. And for this final half-hour segment, I'm speaking with my guest, Andrew Hoy. And uh, so far, we've been addressing uh, just, uh, just a tiny, just the tip of the iceberg of some of the engineering problems uh, associated with the traditional rectangular box model of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And again, if you want to read more on it, uh, you can get a lot more detail if you go to project314.org. And under the Design tab, just click on the Design tab, the drop-down menu, Outside the Box. Um, now we're going to segue to the punchline. Okay, if it isn't a rectangle, then what is it? And uh, one of the things that intrigued me, I, I was blessed to be able to see uh, a few of Andrew's presentations. And in the beginning of one of them, he talked about uh, some of the, the structures that were almost universally constructed in the ancient world. So, uh, Andrew, take it away. Sure. Um, well, you, you have like the, the yurt design, and uh, yurt is, uh, you know, the etymology there again, uh, ger is the Hebrew word for, for sojourn, and um, some, some cultures actually uh, make their, the, the sound of that building is just more like a gert. It's more of a, a guttural uh, G, which is, you know, very, very similar to uh, English Y, and so, you know, th- there's... Yurts have been uh, used on on several continents. You know, Genghis Khan traveled, uh, you know, commanded the, the Mongol Empire from uh, a yurt pulled on 22 oxen. This is a, a round building, and uh, you've got uh, you know Native Americans building around South Americans building around Aborigines and and uh, African huts and stuff. Like it. Round is is a very practical shape. You you have uh, you know, think of a, a fire inside of a, a house, a chimney, etc. Uh, you know, if it's if it's round, you got it's it's heated evenly. You know, on the inside. Plus, you have a logical spot for a chimney with a higher ceiling. Oh, like um, a, like an igloo, even. Or, yeah, igloos, uh, teepees. Um, you know, an arch is is a is about the strongest uh, uh, you know, means of, of construction that's that's known. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was I was studying the curtains and. Uh, I started looking at the, the math on the curtains, and I, I say, okay, uh, eleven of these curtains, and they're they're thirty cubits long. Um, that's just the fold one in half. Well, if you're connecting all the curtains uh, long edge to long edge, again, that that's going to be eleven times four. This is forty four. This is forty four long. So if you connect them on the short edge, it's eleven times thirty, which is three hundred thirty. Well, now if you fold the, the the one in half rather than you know reducing it from uh, 44 to 42, you're actually going to go reducing it from uh, 330 long to uh, 315 long. Now, the thing is, is this makes a really long strip. You know, the picture a piece of toilet paper uh, rolled out, and uh, let's see, you'd have about uh, uh, 15, you'd have the equivalent of 30 squares. So, so take uh, your toilet paper out, you know, roll it out on the ground, 30 squares long, you know, that's the same proportion set that you're, you're looking at for uh, tabernacle curtains if you join them on the short edges. Well, there's another caveat here is, is it doesn't give you any special latitude for, you know, it, it says connect these, connect these curtains, you know, one to another by means of, of loops that are on the side of the curtains. Okay, well, if you're doing that, it doesn't give you exclusion to say, oh, I'll put the ones on the end. And so when you, when you come around, you say, well, that's, that's describing a cylinder, and, and that's not the really, you know, fascinating thing. So I, I, was, I was looking at this, and I was saying, well, how does this lay out? I was just looking at the numerology tied into it, because I, I, that's another, you know, uh, hobby of mine is just looking into some numerology from time to time. And, and um, I find out, well, 315, well, that's, that's really close to a multiple of, of a, you know, a really important math con- constant. And so I'm, I'm reading a little farther than in the text the next verse after I said, okay, uh, you know, 11 times 30 is 330. 
you know, minus the 15 for the folded in half one, that's 315. And then it says in the next verse, and take a little from here, a little from there, about a cubit. And, and I, oh my, I said, this is, this is pi. You know, this is, you know, this is the relationship between a, a circle circumference and diameter. It's, you know, 3.14159, you know, two, uh, you know, it goes on and on forever, but this is, this is a rounded version. So, you know, 314, this is, this is the, uh, uh, this is the most accurate represent, representative of pi in the ancient world. You know, there's, there's other cultures who had, you know, close, but this, this is, you know, pi to two digits. So we're looking at one twentieth of one percent. So when I saw that, I'm like, this thing is, it's got to be round. <laughs> it just, it has to be. And so I started looking at the, the rest of the hardware descriptions, and and uh, you know, a lot of them are given without dimension, and a lot of them are given, uh, you know kind of contingent, contingent on other, other uh, hardware pieces, um, you know, so that the length of one piece is determined by the, you know, relative positioning of, of two pieces, et cetera. Um, and so when I started looking at that, it, there's, unfortunately, there's a lot of other translation hurdles to overcome. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to play King Jim, King Jimmy literalist, uh, sorry, you, you might as well just go home. You, you can, uh, um, you, you're just not going to get there from here because they take all these words and they're translating it uh, with the the thinking that hey these curtains are joined uh, flat edge to flat edge this makes a big rectangular patch we're making something big and long like a Winnebago or a, a tractor trailer of a truck and this is what we're covering up end of story and so they they start translating all these other words and, and this took me a while to figure out uh, just you know because I wasn't that familiar with the translation I'm looking at the Hebrew it's like well you know I did I did uh, go to Israel to learn Hebrew but you know I didn't learn every single word and I didn't learn every uh, uh, you know especially in in, in the, in the you know, biblical record you know there's still lots of vocabulary I got to go yet and uh, I started looking at this and, and getting into the, the, the meanings of these words and, and finding out how, how skewed the entire translation is, uh, basically to, to, you know, give them some, you know, the, the, the represent, representation that we know. So what we're looking at with this rectangle is, is all, you know, based on inference, inference and assumptions. So they, they had one question when they, when they were told to put these sheets together. Which way do they go? Do they go long end to long edge or short edge to short edge? And you do that wrong, and you, you're going to get the wrong shape. So, so, it's, that's, that's so it take. starts with the the presum- Either way, you've got all these curtain strips, and it says connect the edges. So you've only got two ways to connect them: at the long end, or at the short end. And if you connect them at the long end, you you can't help but end up with a rectangle. But if you connect them at the short end, you end up with a circle. So take it from there i mean what what about all the parts and do is it a better more efficient way of utilizing the parts that you have if we're coming back from ikea and opening the box i mean uh, w- w- what are we looking at here if it's a circle well sure i mean um you know first of all the, the space it, it tends to you know as far as the economy of materials you know nobody in their right mind builds a tent with with thick heavy walls you, you're 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 portable you're desert people you're, you're you're nomadic you're going from one spot to the next you're carrying this thing for miles if you're going to be making a tent why are you going to make one that's that's uh uh you know that heavy i mean this is this is like worse than, than dragging a tractor trailer behind because a tractor trailer i'm sure is just uh, i haven't i haven't checked the weight on those things but you know you're not you're not pulling 100 tons on a, on a tractor trailer but you are with the, the amount of wood that you got here with the big thick beams and so I'm saying no. These these things, if you if you're staggering them, and and you're putting this this frame structure in in a in a circular arrangement, and you're you're spacing them out the way that you would expect to put you know every tent frame that I've been in, you know you got poles on the edges and and uh, you know this is how you're spanning fabric. This is what you're doing when you're building a tent. You are spanning fabric, and you you get a, a space uh, that the area the, the the square footage on the on the ground alone is is you know, 17 times uh, larger this way. Um, you, you get a, a, a structure that's like three times, uh, three times taller as well. So this is this is really a remarkable building, is what it is. It's like a big, uh, big round circus tent. Uh, and then some, yeah. It's uh, it's more stable than a circus tent, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, and if you can imagine, 
you know, the Israel's Israel's enemies, and uh, you know, they're, they're talking about this this big, uh, you know, huge, um, you know, this this tribe that's come out of Egypt, and and you know, looking up every every resource on the land. Uh, if you can imagine, you know, being uh, a few miles out and and seeing this thing, you know, you got a, a cloud of fire, uh, you know, by night, uh, a cloud by day, and and you know, pillar of fire by night. You know, if we're talking this thing, you know, being, you know, lit up, uh, you know, this is something you could be seeing, you know, for, for miles. Oh, I mean, yeah. Would... You, and you t- we had a conversation about that, too. Uh, talk about the um, the red leather. I mean, would it be somewhat uh, translucent? Well, sure. I mean, uh, leather is, I mean, you get into, uh, uh, take a take a chamois, take a, you know, when you're, when you're, uh, when you're, after you're done washing your car, you, you get the, these leather chamois, and you, you wipe off uh, your, your chamois, uh, or you wipe off the water, you know, with the with the chamois. Hold that up to the sunlight. You, you can see how much uh, you know light can pass through. So, um, you know, in in uh, the Betzalel model, as I call it, the um, uh, the center is you, you've got an untreated center with with more light. Uh, on the outside, you have uh, uh, or I'm sorry, on the on the lower part of of the uh, the structure, you're going to have a the, the tanned leather. So it's it's, it's a two tone, and uh, I think that that light is is uh, passage is deliberate because you know this was set up on Aviv one. You know this is the first day of the first month, and if if they're on you know different calendar, this is very close to the equinox basically uh, in modern calendar terms, and so. You know they are told to put it up with it oriented in, in specific ways. You know north, south, east, west. Okay, here's the east gate, etc. The, the gate was is located towards the east. Well, this is something that you can do on the equinox because the equinox, uh, you know, you got the the equal shadow thing going on. So a, a yurt, which has got a, a big you know ring in the center, is uh, is something that's. Uh, 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 I was going to say the. Uh, it, it's it's something. It becomes a timepiece. Is is where I'm going with that. Well, that's interesting too. And I would think that um, to set it up, I mean, all you need is a appropriate length rope for the for the radius, I guess, right? Uh, right, you, right. You figure out where center is going to be, and the dude just takes you know stretches the rope out and walks in a circle, and they plant the uh, uh, securing stakes for the curtains, right? Right, right. Um, you, you have. Uh, well, or, or you're, you're setting a marking location. You know, I'm. Uh, you know, I don't put silver on this model. I don't believe that that's what's being conveyed because I think these these beams are being described. Uh, you know, it talks about how they're being set uh, one to another, basically woman woman to sister, and uh, it, it, one protruding from the next. And, and to me, the the this is another textual non-compliance. If you start looking at Hebrew, I think. Uh, as far as how these other ones are are set, it's it's not in a protruding fashion at all. So, if you have them protruding, um, you know your your uh, your mechanics are such that uh, again you're, you're you're spreading out the, the the span of the whole thing more. You're 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 just making you know better use of your materials. It's... And so, if if the pillar of fire is going down through the middle of that thing, then I mean it, that would have been. Well, first of all, probably pretty comforting to the Israelites who were camped out around it. I, I, I remember when I first heard your thesis, uh, I was I had to drive back home. My my wife's uh, her, my father-in-law had died, and we were at a uh, memorial service for him. And um, it was out in Fort Fort Worth. I live in the Dallas area, so it was you know it was a pretty decent drive back home. But it was raining real hard, and. Um, I was basically stuck in a really long traffic jam on the highway, and I'm looking at all these red tail lights out in front of me, and this random thought pops in my head. I wonder why they put red tail lights on cars, you know, just kind of a stupid random thought. But then I remembered when I was in the army, and also in the Boy Scouts even, um, they always told us at night that we had to put a red filter on our flashlight. And when I went through flight school, I learned that the reason for that is that um, if you go from a well-lit area like indoors to outside, it takes you about 20 minutes to dark adapt for your eyes, the retina, to uh, have enough rhodopsin in the, uh, in the, in the rods uh, accumulated so that you can see at night. And one of the colors that doesn't mess up the rhodopsin in your night vision is red. 
So I, I thought, wow, you know, if, if that's the case, this light going through the middle of it, and it's semi-transparent, and it's all glowing, this red kind of nice, soothing, glowing light at night as a night light, but to, the, to their enemies, that would have been a terrifying sight to behold out in the desert. Yeah, I mean, it, it really speaks to uh, a combination of, of ancient tech and, uh, and ability and, and getting into the, the organization, you know, to, uh, to, to make something so massive. I mean, who, who in the world, who in the history has, has made a tenth of that size? I mean, you know, we're, we're talking, uh, if you're using a 25-inch uh, cube, but you're, you're talking, uh, you know, s- neighborhood of six stories tall. Six stories tall? That is... Well, how would well? Uh, we probably don't have time to get into the, the engineering aspects of how they build something like that. I mean, but I mean to to raise up. Well, well, first of all, what would be the supporting structures? Are you saying that the what would be the walls of the rectangle are now becoming interlinking joints for like the supporting ribs of the dome? I mean, how, how does it work? Right, right. It's uh, you know it is very much like a, a rib dome and. Um, uh, you, you've got the, the whole thing is, is resting on something resembling pillars. Guess how many there are? Oh, say there's 10. How many commandments do we have? We have 10. Huh. Um, you know, it, it becomes a real, uh, uh, you know, it, as far as a practical uh, thing, I mean, I'm not looking at redundant, you know, roofs. You're talking about the, the, the red site. Um, you know, in this, you've got uh, that, you know, probably, you know, red in for a reason, right? If, if we've got this, I'm saying that this is a visible layer of the leather, and uh, you know if it is lit up, it's something uh, you know again that this, this speaks to purpose. And you know I'm, I'm of the view that every single detail in there is, is perfect. Every I mean th- this is this uh, image actually has uh, more more symbolism than the rectangular one by you know factors of ten. <laughs> oh gosh, um, yeah, sure does. They, so so they you know the, the name of the project. I, I've got two projects here. Uh, one is project314.org, and the other one, uh, Project Betzalel. Project Betzalel, um, you know, I'm looking to to build models here, and also I'm looking to do, uh, you know, um, media arts type stuff. So, um, oh, I was going to say with the, uh, oh, I, I just lost my train of thought here. Um, uh, what, what were you just talking on? Um, well, just how amazing the thing would have looked out there. I mean, oh, okay. So, so Betzalel, the, the, the word Betzalel. This is the guy who 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 Moses, you know, had tasked to to build the house. Now, uh, in Hebrew, you, you've got every letter having a character, and you can you can break up words. You know, they come from smaller words like Hezekiah. Uh, Hazak is is you know getting into strength. Strength of Yah. You know, Yah is the Name for for God. So you got all these different names. You know, David. David is the beloved. You know, that's that's what his name means. All Hebrew names have meaning, and Betzalel is no exception. So you have Betzalel. Uh, the the better, which is like where we get our English letter B from, is is basically in, in Hebraic uh, you know languages is uh, a house. Uh, uh, the word Saul is is a shadow or image, and L is, is God. And so you've got literally the guy who's building the house, his name happens to be yeah. house in, in God's image. Is This is what he's, he's building. So this this image, you know, as conveyed by the round model, is, is there's there's just loads more imagery and, and uh, revelation that's being offered with it. And that's why I think this is, you know, such an important uh, uh, discovery. So we end up with a... Circle with a dome over it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, what intrigues me about that is that uh, we learn that Moses was given a blueprint of something in heaven that was supposed to be emulated on earth. So, I mean, we don't have time to unpack that, but just thinking about that alone has tremendous uh, implications. I mean, we've probably got about a uh, little less than 10 minutes left. Some people may say, so what? Who cares? What is the significance of any of this? Why do we need to know this? Um, well, I guess I would I just maybe reiterate. Um, uh, I, I I was giving a presentation uh, this weekend here, and this is a topic that came up, and um, a question that came up, and and uh, one of the, the the people who was you know a big big fan of what I presented was was really frustrated with. Uh, the, the question, the fact that it was even asked, and, and kind of the spirit with which it was asked, 
and you know, she started praying about it. Her, you know, her name's Ruthie, and Ruthie's, um, you know, she she got into her uh, as far as the answer on that was was you know, don't you want to get to know me? So again, if this is this is this is Betzalel, this is house and image of God. You know, is it is it unimportant somehow that we we know his image? I mean, he takes these people out of bondage. He says, I want them to hold a festival to me, and Okay, now that you're here at Sinai, I want you to build it. I want you to build my house. Okay, so this is this is about me, like me, you know, for me, etc. You know, I want you to build this. This is important. And um, yeah, again, they're they're they think it's important enough to build the you know the rectangle. And how much more you know is it to to build? I think this 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 round one because this round one is is really uh, again it's it's the it, it is an image and. Um, yeah, it's just the, the resemblance to other things in nature, uh, you know, body, you know, the uh, physiology, you know, the human anatomy connections are just, uh, I think, remarkable. Oh, um, yeah, it looks like an eyeball. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it talks about how, the, you know, uh, Israel's the apple of, of God's eye, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, so you got this, this big, uh, um, you know, eyeball uh, <laughs> shaped thing sitting in their camp. I mean, that's uh, um, yeah, and it, it, it's really um, oh, let's see. I'm, I'm trying to think of, of uh, some some small tidbits that I can throw out. Um, well, you got well, about, I guess you got about five minutes, a, so <laughs> okay. So yeah, um, that's allow. So another another word for. Uh, uh, Another meaning of Betzalel, we have the idea it's God's onion because in Hebrew Betzal is onion. Well, how how does an onion work? Huh. You, you ever peel an onion? I mean, yeah, yeah. what does an onion have? It has layer Rings. after layer after layer, and and guess what? If you ever see an onion growing in the field, uh, you know, in your garden or what have you, uh, a lot of the onion varieties, of course, are, are what they're cropping out uh, near the soil. I mean, this the the way that this you know this uh, dome structure um, crop it you know has an appearance of, of cropping out. You know, so here here's a guy named Betzalel, house and image of God, um, and incidentally, um, getting into the the name of God, one of the the names of God is, is El Shaddai, and and the, the way that I, I figured this you know connection out, I said, well, okay, three fourteen. What does three fourteen mean in Hebrew? Well. You know, Hebrew, ancient Hebrew didn't have the, the Roman, uh, not only Roman numerals, but it didn't have uh, it, uh, Ar- Arabic. I think that, that the number new, number system we have now is, is uh, uh, Arabic in origin, if I'm not mistaken. Well, the, the and, Hebrew uh, letters were numbers. Right, right. And so you, you've got the same way you'd say, okay, if A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, every, every single word that they spoke would have a numerical value. Yeah. And, and so I, I said, okay, well, what is the value of, of 314 in Hebrew? Well, uh, shin is 300. Uh, yud, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, yud is 10, and, and dalit is, is 4. So this is, these are the words with which you use to, to spell Shaddai, okay? So we got El Shaddai is the name for God. It's like God Almighty. And so I would even go so far as to argue it's implying God eternal because of, of what should I, you know, the 314, what, what does that imply? It implies he's the, the God without beginning or end, okay? So if El Shaddai says, make a house in my image, it stands to reason it would remem- resemble his at name. least one of his names, right? Wow, that's pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, so, um, yeah, we got about four minutes left. Um, this is barely phase one, right? You've got a couple of phases you were in this whole project, right? Right. I mean, first I, I, I want to get into, uh, well, I, I should say what I, what I produce right now, because the exegesis is so important, and uh, this is, you know, I, I call it the, my exodus engineering exegesis because I'm, I'm uh, you know, looking at the shapes and saying, well, this is how I'm presenting the shape. This is based on this language, this phrase, et cetera. And so I, I have a, uh, a set of drawings that I've made, which conveys, uh, you know, a, a ver- it, it does the exegesis on a verse by verse basis. I've got, you know, tables with columns. You don't have to be a massive Hebrew scholar, but you know, I'm trying to help you guys out for from the standpoint of, okay, you're used to King James English. I'm sorry, you know, you guys are victims like I. Am. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, yeah, it's uh, it's an unfortunate reality, and um, we have to get beyond the translation. And so I made this as a tool so that someone who, who's wanting to know, you know, how, what the actual text is, is saying without without all the rectangular skewedness uh, in it as part of the translation, um, you know, so they can see, you know, firsthand, you know, what, how these simple words translate. So this is this is, you know, my first and principal and most important effort because if it, if it doesn't, you know, hold up to the, the text, the translation, what good is it? Then I'm just another, you know, ranting heretic, right? Yeah. Um, so we got, but, we got uh, about a minute left. Where can people uh, find out more about your materials and contact you? Well, right now, uh, project314.org. Um, again, I'm going to be uh, another website and, you know, the 314.org, I am uh, hoping to do a crowdfunding soon so I can be producing more videos here. Uh, to, to get into the education so people aren't relying on a drawing set because not a lot of people either have the technical moxie interest or inclination to look through you know, someone's drawings like that. So I want to make uh, you know, more videos, et cetera, and then I want to start getting into uh, model building as well. So I'm looking for you know, collections of volunteers on this, and that's also uh, on my web page. So, and can they, uh, but, uh, project... you, can they contact you through project314.org? That's correct. Oh, very good. Wow, man, I, I knew we were going to run out of time. There's just so much to, to talk about, but this is certainly a good teaser. And as I say, I always leave them wanting more, so hopefully they'll uh, go check your, your site out. I hope you do get the funding. I'd love to see one of these things actually constructed out there somewhere. I think that would be pretty amazing. But, um, wow, man, uh, that's all the time we have for tonight. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on uh, with us tonight. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Amen. And thank you guys so much for listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project. That's all the time we have for tonight, so we'll see you back uh, same time next week. Good night, everybody. Mm-hmm.